Romans 8, verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Amen. You can be seated, and our kids five and under are dismissed to the nursery. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the words that were read this morning. We thank you, Lord, that they are words that were years and years ago inspired by your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the, the heights that these words bring us to. We thank you, Lord, for the truth that they are. They testify of your Son, Jesus. They testify of our life in him. Lord, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit this morning, the same Holy Spirit who inspired these words to illumine these words, that we may understand them rightly. Not only understand them this morning, but also that they may be applied to our life, that uh, they may sink down to our very foundation and, and be a part of us. We ask this, Lord, that you may be glorified, that your gospel, your salvation, uh, your gospel message would go forth powerfully. Thank you, Lord, for what a good, good God that you are. We pray and ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, as I uh, suspected last week, when I told Tim that I'd be preaching on Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, that what I really meant was that I would be preaching through verses 1 through 4 of verses 1 through 11. So this is still a message on verses 1 through 11. It's just verses 1 through 4 first because of the density of what we find in Paul's words in Romans chapter 8. As I expect it is for many in this room, The eighth chapter of the book of Romans has a place near and dear to your hearts and to our lives. It is a passage full of precious promises, truths, and comforts. Uh, This very first verse, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a precious promise. We'll be examining this in depth this morning. Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Verses 16 and 17, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Verse 26, 
We are told that likewise the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness. We don't know what to pray for. We don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. Verse 28, a very familiar passage, one that I go to very often. We know that those, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, all things work together to the good. I memorized Romans 8 years ago in the New King James Version. And as much as I love the ESV, you'll notice I kind of swap some of these words and terms around because that's just, that's just what happens. So we have verses 29 and 30, the great golden chain of redemption. Those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. In Romans chapter 8, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, scales the heights of holy doctrine, putting on glorious display God's love for us in Christ Jesus. Later on, Paul writes, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son... <laughs> but gave him up for us all, how shall he not also graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, and he is at the right hand of God, and he is interceding for us. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are to be regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation can separate us. In the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. <laughs> Beloved, we could do worse this morning than just reading Romans chapter 8 out loud, praying through it, and meditating on these precious words. Regardless, turning our attention back to verses 1 through 4. The main point, the main thrust of this subsection is found in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the main truth. Verses three through four support this truth, explain this truth, tell us how this truth can be true. We're told in verse, in verse two that this truth is true because in Christ Jesus we have been set free from the law of sin and death. In verse three, this, we're told this truth is true. There's no now condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus because God has done for us in Christ what the law could not do. We're told in verse 4 that the righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled for those who walk according to the Spirit. That is how verse 1 can be true. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The first thing to see in that verse is that it contains a, a key word, therefore. Some of you may remember that old Bible interpretation uh, idea. Whenever you see the word therefore, you should take a look and see what it's there for. Why is it there? It's there because the statement that begins chapter 8 is based on the thought, the idea, the argument, or the ideas that Paul has been building up to previously. Paul is building on and making a point about a previous statement or idea. So we need to go back to chapter 7 and see what that is. And in chapter 7, what we have is theological doctrine wrapped up in personal experience. Paul is speaking on the law and sin in chapter 7. And in particular, he is making a, the point that although the law is a very good thing, the effect that it has on sinful flesh, the effect that it has on you and I, is that of condemnation. He writes in verse 10, the very commandment that promised life, well, it proved to be death to me. Why? Because sin, the sin that's in me, seizing an opportunity through that commandment, it deceived me and it killed me. Paul says we're not to blame the law 
Again, he says the law is good. Rather, he says it's, it's not the law itself that, that, that kills me. It's, it's my sin. It says, he says in verse 13, it was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that, might, that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. He goes on to say in chapter 7, and, and this is where he gets personal. I don't understand my own, my own actions. <laughs> For I, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. I hope as, as we're, we're going through this, this section in chapter 7 that this resonates with many of you. It did for me. It always has. I can relate maybe not quite so much to some of the different folks in, that we read about in Scripture, but when Paul's talking about his sin and his struggle with sin, oh boy, <laughs> I relate. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want, it's what I keep doing. Verse 21, so I find it to be a law that, I, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, and, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord, so that I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. What well, Paul is communicating here is the struggle that all true Christians have. It is that struggle, that war of or against our sinful flesh. Such was the battle that waged the soul of Paul that almost brings him to a point of despair. But in the midst of that despair and that darkness, Paul finds an answer to his question, who will deliver me from this body of death? And many of this room, in this room this morning, myself included, can say with Paul, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the ray of hope shining in the darkness of the despair brought about by our sin. The battle indeed, the battle with sin would indeed be hopeless apart from Christ. You and I would indeed be condemned apart from Christ. But thanks be to God that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you struggle with sin? Does it even perhaps seem to you that that battle with sin becomes overwhelming? Well, thanks be to God that though we battle with sin, and frankly, we often lose that battle, if you are truly in Christ, you are still saved. You are not condemned. And that's what Paul is saying, isn't it? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is, even given this massive struggle that I have with sin, this daily fight, hourly it seems sometimes, given that I am yet not condemned because I am in Christ. When he says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, saying no condemnation is another way of saying saved, is it not? To be not condemned is to be Saved, saved from the wrath of God, saved from the penalty of our sin. Indeed, saved from death. John 3, 36, Jesus says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. That's part of what it means to be condemned. When you think about being condemned or not being condemned, being condemned or being saved, to be Condemned is, biblically, to be under the wrath of God. It is to be at war with God. It is to be at enmity with God. It is to be hostile toward God and God hostile toward you. Whoever does not obey the Son is going to be condemned. They will not see life because the wrath of God remains on him. First John 5, 12. However, however, whoever has the Son has life. But 
whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Romans 6.23, a very familiar passage. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see these two inseparable ideas. Where you have sin, you have death. Where you have sin, you have condemnation, which leads to death. Where you have the Holy Spirit, where you have righteousness, you have life. Jesus says in John 5, 24, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Again, I want you to see this very clearly this morning. Death and life, condemnation, salvation. This verse is a wonderful promise, and indeed it gives us wonderful hope that in the midst of our struggle with sin, we can begin to despair. We may even begin to think, and, and I have gone there myself personally, <laughs> am I really a Christian? Am I really saved? God's gonna, God should strike me down and send me to hell for this. We, I don't know who said it. Only Christians struggle with sin. There is some hope from, from the standpoint that if you are struggling with sin, you're doing something that a non-believer can't do, right? We, but, but it's real. We have this struggle with sin, and sometimes it can lead to a point where we're just, oh, Lord, it might be better if you just take me now so I might stop sinning. This has gotten so bad. God understood this. Which is why we have these truths. That even in the midst of your struggle, we have this assurance and this promise that if you are in Christ, you are not condemned. You are not under condemnation. You will still mightily struggle with sin, often fail, but you will not be condemned. That is the great hope and promise we have. How can this be true? How can it be possible that, that sinners as wretched and vile as this guy standing in front of you is? How can someone like me be saved? Not only saved, but also have an assurance and a comfort in salvation. Well, verses two through four give us the why, the how, behind how verse 1 can be true. Verse 2, the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. In Christ Jesus, we have been set free from the law of sin and death. What are these two laws that Paul is talking about here. We, we see one described as the law of the spirit of life. We see one described as the law of sin and death. Now, if you go back and search in your Bible, you may find it difficult to find either of those two laws written down anywhere. Well, first of all, what does Paul mean by the law of the spirit of life? I'm going to give John MacArthur's answer. I've got a, a little bit different answer. I'm giving John MacArthur's answer first because, well, he's John MacArthur. He answers this question by saying that the law of the spirit of life is nothing less than the gospel. The gospel, which is a law, why? Because it demands our obedience. Acts chapter 17, verse 30, the times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. So John MacArthur says the law of the spirit of life is indeed the gospel. Um, I don't mean to disagree with John MacArthur, but... I think it's an acceptable and even a good answer. I've got a little bit different way of looking at it. Because of the second law Paul speaks of here, the law of sin and death. Now, there's a number of, there's some controversy over what Paul is speaking about here. Is he talking about like the Mosaic law? Is he talking about the old covenant? Is he talking about the law that he speaks of in other places? And um, I don't think there he is actually talking about the Mosaic law. Because he calls it the law of sin and death. But that seems to fly in the face of Paul's previous comments in chapter 7 when he's talking about the law and he says, well, what shall we say then? Is, is the law sin? By, by no means. That's not sin. And then why would he in the very next chapter say, well, this is, you know, the, it's the law of sin and death. I, I don't think those two are the same. 
I would suggest that what Paul's referring to here when he talks about the law of the spirit of life and the law of sin of death, sin and death, he's talking about different principles, different truths. The law of the spirit of life is not a, a moral code or necessarily something that has been written down, but it is this principle, this truth, that the Holy Spirit brings life. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin and righteousness and, and judgment. It is the Holy Spirit who regenerates the believer, who causes the believer to be born again. It is the Holy Spirit who applies the finished work of Christ that he accomplished on the cross to a believer, such that we are literally delivered from the domain of darkness, the domain of Satan, to the domain of light, to the kingdom of God. We are delivered from slavery to sin. We are actually delivered from death unto life. So there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the Holy Spirit has come and he has brought us life. He has delivered us away from the condemnation of our failure to meet the righteous requirements of the law. He regenerates us. He delivers us from this principle that if you are a sinner, if you are an unrepentant sinner, if you are not in Christ, then all you have to look forward to is death, is judgment. You are under condemnation right now, and that condemnation will come to fruition at some point. And not only may you experience death of your flesh, you'll experience the second death when you're thrown into the fiery lake. That, I believe, is the law of sin and death. That sin brings death always. And the only way that we can be delivered from that is through the, the law, the principle of the spirit of life when the Holy Spirit comes and regenerates us and saves us. Therefore, verse 3, we are told that God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. He did this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. The law is not evil. It's not sinful, but it was inadequate, not because of any fault in the law, but because of the fault within us, our own flesh. The law is good, but it could not save. The law is good, but it's, it's not a ladder that you can use to climb up to heaven. It's a mirror we gaze into and see how, how, fall, how <laughs> far short we fall of the righteousness and holiness of God. The flesh is unable to keep the law. So in considering the law and considering how well we measure up against the law, the only answer that we have there when we, we see that is, I am a sinner. And if I am a sinner and the wages of sin is death, then as a sinner, all I can expect is death. Paul says here that the law was weakened by the flesh. That the flesh is actually unable to keep the law. So God, God had to act. God had to do what we could not do. God had to do what the law could not do. And God did this. He sent his son, Jesus, to do what the law could not do. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 tells us that Jesus set aside his divine privileges that he had in heaven. And he took on the likeness of a human. Romans chapter 8, we're told that uh, God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Um, yes, Jesus came, fully human. He, he looked like someone who would be a sinner. In fact, many people accused him of sin when he was here on earth. But we know from scripture that he never, ever sinned. Not only did he not ever sin, but he actually fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law. So he took on the appearance of sinful flesh, but he was not a sinner. God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, and through Jesus Christ, he condemned sin in the flesh. That is, as Paul states in Galatians chapter 3, Christ redeemed us from what is called the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? You violate the law, you die. That's the curse of the law. Rather, Jesus became a curse in our place. He became a curse for us. 
For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. God's divine justice was satisfied on the cross because sin was punished. God's divine grace and mercy and love was put on display because he took Christ's righteousness and he applied it to those of us who do not deserve it in any way, shape, or form. Which brings us to verse 4. We're told that he did these things in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk according, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Paul describes this in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. He says, you, you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, God has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach, reproach for him. Now I'm going to re repeat something I think I said a minute ago. And it's this idea, this concept, which I, I, I can state, I, I think, this truth, but if you ask me to explain it, my, my brain is too puny. I, I, I just don't have the cognitive ability to, to like, well, you know, show you and diagram it out. And, well, this is how all this works. All I know is what Scripture says is that on the cross, God punished Jesus Christ for the sins that you and I and all the people who would ever put their faith and trust in him, God punished Jesus for those sins, him who he was sinless. And when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, when we believe in him and trust in him, repent of our sins, then somehow, some way, and again, I don't understand how this works, God credits that righteousness of Christ to us. He justifies us. He says, literally, you are just. We who are unjust, it's a, a forensic righteousness. That is a legal righteousness. And it is a legal righteousness. God sees us as having the righteousness of Christ, even though, as we've mentioned again and again, you and I, we born again, God sees us as the righteousness of Christ, and yet we struggle with sin mightily. <laughs> we will till we die or the Lord comes again. Since we are incapable of fulfilling the righteous requirements of the law, God did what we could not do and sent his son to die in our place and gave Christ's righteousness to us as our own. But this isn't true for everybody. This is only true for those who walk according to the Spirit. This is only true for those who have been born again. This is only true for those who have repented of their sins and placed their faith and trust in Christ Jesus. Who are those that walk according to the Spirit? Only those who have been born again, regenerated by the Holy Spirit. You can't walk in what you do not possess. And the question to ask yourself this morning is, have I been born again? Do I walk in the Spirit? Have I truly trusted Jesus Christ and, and, and thrown away any idea of trusting in my own righteousness, my own works, my own walk, my own efforts? Have, have I cast that aside <laughs> repented of my sin, turned away from my sin, agreed with God that I'm sinful and deserving of condemnation, and cast myself upon the mercy of God. Have you done that? Have you done that? We are told in Scripture that, that when we place our faith and trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit, and, and there's a logical order here, be careful on these things, but in that great transaction, the Holy Spirit comes and he brings life. He causes us to be born again. It causes us to see Christ as precious to us. And we're delivered from the domain of darkness into the domain of, of light. We are brought literally from death unto life. And as much as we will struggle in this life with sin, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because we have that Holy Spirit of promise. We have been sealed with that Holy Spirit, and it cannot be taken away from us. God will not take it away from us. And we go down a very small rabbit trail this morning, potentially some dangerous ground, and try to bring it back. I believe I can bring it back to the main point of the sermon this morning. Um, there's been a lot of talk, a lot of media coverage, about what's going on at Asbury 
I don't know if I pronounced that right. Asbury University, the revival going on there. It's been getting a lot of press lately. Let me just say up front that it's incredibly difficult to diagnose at a distance. I don't have enough information to be able to stand before you this morning and say, well, it's definitely a movement of the Holy Spirit. It's definitely some wacko thing, and you all should ignore it. I, I don't know enough to make a definitive statement about it. I have been in Christian circles long enough to have seen several things kind of along these lines. They've come and gone, and I've developed a fairly healthy, and I believe biblical, perspective of caution when it comes to such things. And let me just give you a little bit of what I believe the perspective we need to have on such things. First John chapter 4, John writes and says, Beloved, don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God, and because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Uh, what John is saying there, if I, I'll just repeat what he said, it's pretty clear. Test the spirits. Test the spirit of the age. Test what's going on. Why? Because there's a lot of false prophets. There's a lot of people speaking falsehood out there. First Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 19, we're told, don't quench the spirit. No, we should not quench the Holy Spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but do this thing. Test everything and hold fast to what is good. Christ himself warned us in Matthew chapter 24 that if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, and he's talking about people saying, you know, the Christ has come, you know, and, and here he is. He says, uh, uh, you know, here's the Christ, or there he is, you don't believe it. But this, because, uh, because false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Again, what do we know about these things? We know false Christs are going to come. False prophets are going to come. They're going to try and deceive the people of God. We need to be careful desiring signs and wonders. We need to be careful desiring what we would call visible manifestations of the Spirit. Speaking of signs and wonders, Christ condemned the, the Pharisees and Sadducees who came to him and they came to test him. They asked him to show, him a, show them a sign from heaven, and he said, an evil, an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And he says, well, no sign is going to be given this generation except the sign of Noah. So, in summary, we need to have a very healthy dose of caution and test the spirits, test them against truth, against Scripture. Let us not be like those who, have, who seek after signs and wonders, Rather, we should be like the Bereans, Luke describes in Acts chapter 17, who says of them they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, and they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. Whenever you run into a situation like this or any other kind of difficult situation going on, if it's theological or doctrinal, the first place you should go is not, how do I feel about this? It, it is, what does Scripture say about this, either specifically or in principle? We are to be men and women, children of the book. That's one thing I'd like to say about that. Second thing is this. Whether what is happening at Asbury University is indeed a moving of the Holy Spirit, don't forget this. That the Holy Spirit is here today, in this room, moving. And just because there aren't, CNN isn't here, or cameras, or there aren't interesting things, what we would say, interesting things going on, doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit isn't moving mightily in this room this morning. Have you been convicted of sin in your life? That is a moving of the Holy Spirit. Have you come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of the things of God this morning? That's the Holy Spirit moving in this room. Has your love for God and your love for God's people been stirred up this morning? That's the Holy Spirit moving and acting. Have you been moved to prayer this morning? Holy Spirit, have you basked in the joy of being in the presence of brothers and sisters in Christ and rejoicing together in song? I almost, okay, I'm, I'm probably not the best example because I'm a bit of a weeper, but I was moved to tears <laughs> during one of the songs this morning. Not because it was a sad song, but because the, of the, the beauty of the truth which, that we were singing about and the beauty of our Savior that we were lifting up in praise. 
Who points to Christ? Who points to his work? It is the Holy Spirit who is doing that. Have you been comforted to and ministered to in and through the preached word of God this morning? Has God's word given you a greater sense of hope and assurance of your salvation this morning? It's not me. As much as I respect the preaching of, of our pastor, Tim, it's not him. Where are you? Love you, man. It's the work of the Holy Spirit ministering in and through his preached word. I really do hope that what is going on at Asbury truly is the moving and acting of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know. But at the end of the day, that's not really my concern. My concern this morning is much more this. That in this room, do you understand? Do you appreciate? Can you come perhaps even to love what Paul has to say here? That there's therefore now no condemnation for you if you are in Christ Jesus. That as much as you struggle with sin and fail on a, on a daily basis, you're not condemned. You're in Christ. The Holy Spirit has sealed you. You will live. You will not experience the second death. You are adopted into the family of God. You are an heir and co-heir, co-heir with Jesus Christ. If indeed the spirit of Christ is in you. Do you rejoice that you have been set free from the law of sin and death? Do you rejoice that you who are dead in trespasses and sin have been born again unto new life? Do you rejoice that if you are in Christ, you are indeed a new creation? The old has passed away. The new has come. Do you rejoice that you are in this room this morning, in this fellowship, enjoying a foretaste of the joy and fellowship and love that we'll experience in heaven someday when we've not only been delivered from the the, the penalty of sin and the power of sin will have been delivered even from the very presence of sin. No one's going to line up and throw, you know, put cameras out there because we're preaching a message this morning that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But rightly understood, it is, it is an earth-shattering truth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. It is indeed powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It does those things. And it also, it also can make us wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, it's my prayer this morning. If there be any here this morning who have not been born again, who have not repented of their sins, who have not turned to you in faith and trust. Lord, not because of the, the, the words of my mouth, but Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you come and transform and bring to life, regenerate that we may rejoice together in a new soul brought to life. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. <laughs>